and welcome to Psych Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. I'm Eric Landrum, along with Garth Newfeld, your podcast hosts. As the name implies, we center on conversations about teaching, but we often veer into other interesting topics, which is the end stuff. This is episode number 64, where Garth and I had the opportunity to interview Liza Velis from South Texas College in McAllen, Texas. Before you hear the interview, please allow me to share some listening tips and some of my favorite moments. Garth and I want to express our thanks to the Southwestern Psychological Association for providing some space for psych sessions to record this podcast. And we want to introduce one of the newest features to psych sessions called Ask Psych Sessions. Now, this is going to be a chance to ask a question about the teaching of psychology. Uh, this could be a big picture question or a nuts and bolts question. And Garth and I will get someone on the national or international scene to answer it. And we'll post the question and answers as Ask Psych Sessions bonus episodes, probably on Sunday night starting pretty soon. So, uh, and I'm, I'm going to spell this out for you, but go to bit.ly uh, slash ask psych sessions to post your questions. So it's B-I-T dot L-Y, and that's all lowercase, slash ask psych sessions, all lowercase. So it's bit.ly slash ask psych sessions to post your questions. And there's going to be a, uh, just a really short little Google form there. We thought that would be easier than answering your email. So, you know, when you have kids that you're uh, multiple kids, you're never supposed to say that one is your favorite. Uh, and if you know, if you have, let's say, podcast episodes and you kept saying, this is your favorite, this is the best one ever, that, you know, this is, you're going to enjoy this one. These are awesome. If you keep saying that over and over, you know, then when you say it, it loses value when you do say it. And so you try not to say it, you try not to play favorites, right? Everybody understands this. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to play favorites. You're not supposed to have a favorite professor. You're not supposed to have a favorite student, a favorite child. You're not supposed to have a favorite podcast. This is a really special podcast because uh, Liza is a really special professor teaching at a really special place. Um, I... Uh, when I first met her, I knew she was a special instructor. Uh, when I invited her to be in the podcast, I knew it would be special. When I re-listened to it again to make these notes and draw this recording, I I knew it was, and, and I am pleased to report that I think I'm right. Um, we started with a conversation about names and the importance of names and my inabilities there, and it was it was a great conversation. Um, we talked about the challenges of first generation college students and we, you know, what, what gets layered into this is first generation college students, you know, on the Southern border of the United States. And so you add to that undocumented students and students who might have to be, you know, not only commuting, but commuting across an international border things that I don't think about when I think about the challenges of my first generation students. And so it was fascinating to think about the types of things that Liza has to think about when she's, for example, trying to get students to come to a Psi Beta chapter meeting at um, South Texas College. I mean, it was it's just phenomenal what she does to encourage students to be successful and the amount of effort and and the parts of her own personal story that she shares are nothing less than highly inspirational. Uh, she does tell parts of her own story, which I think you'll enjoy. Uh, her success story um, had setbacks that she had to overcome. Um, she talks a lot about the collectivist culture and staying close to home and how she's connected to her family still to this day. Um and the different personas that people have to take on. Uh, she tells a, a, a lovely, touching story about growing up and wanting to be a cheerleader and wanting to try out and needing a cheerleading uniform and the sacrifices that her parents made that she didn't really realize at the time and the impact that it had, you know, on her family. And, and I, you know, I remember when we recorded this at SWPA uh, tearing up when she told this story, and and I also can tell you that I teared up when I reheard it, um, listening to it again earlier. 
Um, and then we talked a little bit about Psi Beta and some of the benefits that it brings to her students at uh, South Texas College. And so, you know, because she's not able to teach uh, research methods because of statewide dictates. And so that was, you know, really informative to hear about that. Uh, we did talk about, you know, her her path through undergraduate and graduate school and got got some really great stuff about her origin story and, you know, sisterly competitions. And I, I'm not going to go there because it's just going to be a real treat for you to hear it in Liza's own words. And then it's re- it was really kind of interesting as we started to wind down, we wound back up again. And so, you know, I, you know, I, we've done enough of these uh interviews now and you know you get far enough into your career the old man that I am you know when you see talent you see talent and so I started making predictions about you know Liza you're going to be a department chair someday you're going to be a dean if you want to be a provost someday you're going to want to you're going to do that and you're going to see and I made some predictions and you'll see about how maybe some of those uh, have a chance of coming true and then you know she started talking about you know, the challenges of undocumented students doing research. And, you know, there are there are challenges in our country that our students are facing every day that some some of us don't know about. Maybe, maybe because of the white privilege that we have, people like me, maybe because of where we live in the country, maybe because we're just unaware of it. And what I really loved that Liza brought these to the forefront uh, because she lives with them every day. They're part of her culture. They're part of her students' culture. And I just felt blessed to be able to have this conversation and bring it to you through Psych Sessions. So please, enjoy. Uh, welcome to another episode of Psych Sessions. We are thrilled to be here at the Southwestern Psychological Association. So we are here with Liza Vallis. And here's the thing. That why I've been panicking so much about this. And this is, this is an issue for me personally. I really think it's important to get my students' names correct. Mm-hmm. I, I, I struggle with this in my own classroom. It's really important. Uh, I have a number of Hispanic students, but I also have a number of uh, Saudi Arabian students. Mm-hmm. We have a number of um, students, Middle Eastern students, and I really struggle with their names. And so... Um, it's it's a hang up for me as I kind of think you both realize the five minutes leading up to the beginning of this podcast. <laughs> well, so, that's an that's an interesting thing to start with. And, I, I apologize. No, no, I, what, I apologize so much for not getting it right because I know I believe it's really important to get it right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and it's actually uh, very courteous of you, and I think culturally like sensitive of you to try and pronounce my last name correctly um because i've had other people that are not latino and they just you know it's like lies of elise and that's the way i and it's my own fault too because i'm i'm very modest in that way or like i'm not going to correct you because that's being discourteous in my culture so you can butcher my name but i'm not going to say anything especially if you're you know sure i i I try to get my students and i try to encourage them in my class to stop me because Mm -hmm. if they let me do that I will mispronounce it not only the rest of the class, but the rest of their undergraduate career. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. if I learn it wrong, I'm going to learn it wrong. Yes. Well, you, you stopped your sentence halfway through. You said, I'm not going to correct you, especially if you're... And then, and so I'm, I'm thinking sorry, about... Did I no, not at all. I'm just saying, I think that there are, there are times you could have ended with, because it's your podcast, you could have ended it because you're the instructor. I'm not going to correct you for any of these things. Oh, I thought you were going somewhere else. No. Because you're a white male. Well, I think that's the obvious one, right? And that's what she meant. That's what she meant. Well, and it's also the age that you are older than I am. And so that's part of the culture where you don't correct. For the record, she's looking at Eric, not me (laughs) right now. (laughs) Okay. So welcome to the podcast. This is how we roll. No, don't be sorry. No, no. See, that's another cultural thing to Uh, apologize. uh, Oh, okay. Well, then I'm sorry too. Oh, Uh, man. We're going to learn a lot today. Oh, this is going to be awesome. I I told you, I've I've been bragging on you for days, wanting to get you on and talk to you because I think you're awesome. And from the first time I met you, I thought you were awesome. Thank you. And so that's why I wanted to have you on. Um, so I, it, it's an, it's important to me, and and I've I've read stuff in uh, in journal articles, but also Chronicle of Higher Ed and Inside Higher Ed, that you know you know our students from whatever part of the world they're from, or from whatever part of the U.S. they're from, 
it's important for us to recognize them as individuals in our classroom, and that's why I, I just concentrate on it. And nat I am not naturally good at it. It's not a gift that I have, and I get it, and I have to work on it. Mm -hmm. And you could tell that I'm not good at it. I have some sort of block. By the way, I don't have a cognitive map either. Mm -hmm. If you ask me to point to north right now to yeah. save my life, I, I die. <laughs> I mean, I mean, to me, it's never eat soggy watermelon. And to me, north is up. Let's mm -hmm. try. Where is north right I, now, Eric? I have no idea. Really? Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea where north is. like, where is. are the mountains? Um, it doesn't... Where I, are the stars? I, it, I mean, I know that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And so if it's mm -hmm. late enough in the day, I might be able to figure it out. But if it's 12 noon, yeah. I have no idea where north yeah. is. Interesting. Neither do I. I. But I just don't think about that stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah, but when people say go north three blocks yeah. and then turn east, I, landmarks. I go, Give me landmarks. I suspect you guys are thinking about more important things than where is north. So I'm just thankful for GPS. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. I need a name pronouncer. You know, I think one of the phone phone app might do that for you. It'll help you pronounce words, not just names, you, you, but you have to input them correctly too. So you know, what? in my classroom, and and we'll get to the other stuff in a minute. I hope you don't mind the diversion. In my classroom, I give students a folder, and I give them these big Magnum 44 markers in the first beginning of class day. And I have them write their name, their first names, lar or whatever they want to be called, large on the first day of class. And I ask them to bring them to every day to class, and they have them display them over their desk mm -hmm. towards mm -hmm. me. And I wish there was an app where I could just point it at the, and I wish I could be wearing an earbud that would remind me how to say that person's name because I, 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 just, I just have a hard time. Well, that's interesting. That. I'm sure you have students where you struggled to pronounce their names? Or? Well, most of our students where I'm at, South Texas College, are uh, Latino. Okay. Um, some last names may be difficult, but my biggest um, error is that I say them more in a Spanish dominant than English. So, for example, if I see, like yesterday, I almost did it with one of the award winners. His name was da uh, Daniel, so I'm doing it right now. And um, I asked him, I was like, so is it Daniel or is it Daniel? Because his last name was Vega. And he's like, my mom calls me Daniel, so please call me Daniel. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> okay. Um, so I do that too. That's my error. Sometimes I pronounce it in Spanish and my students want it in English. Um, and that's just, you know, to me, that's like ethnic identity kind of being a little washed away because they're living oh, in the United States. Oh, that's interesting. So you have this value of it, it kind of pains you to see the ethnic identity washed away, but at the same time, you value how they want to yes. be called. Yes. You know? like that's I, interesting. I'm mindful of that because, I mean, my first name isn't exactly, you know, Mexican, Um my mom just liked Liza Minnelli, and she named me Liza. <laughs> and I was like, okay. But like my son's name, his name is Alfonso Joaquin. And so I picked that name on purpose because it's not translatable. Like my sister told me, she's like, well, maybe somebody will call him Jake. Like Joaquin is Jake. And I'm like, to me, that's not really the same as like Daniel, Daniel, you know. So, so yeah, names are kind of a big deal for me. And his last name is actually like on his social security card. It's Alfonso Joaquin Rodriguez Velis. And so I had such a hard time at the hospital because they were just like, um, I'm sorry, like we can't do this. And I was like, you're going to have to because that's my culture and that's the way that we do things. Good so, for you. Yeah, we'll see how it goes when he wants to get his driver's license the, or something. I mean, what, and what crap at a hospital that you tell them what you want the name to be and they say to you, we can't do this. Mm -hmm. What crap. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting because at the beginning of this conversation, you said, well, in, sometimes culturally I'm not going to correct or mm -hmm. assert myself. Mm -hmm. And then there are obviously other situations where, I mean, this is a bit of a big deal, right? Yeah, it's a, a huge kid. deal. right? Yeah. But there are certain situations where you do just Yeah, assert. and who knows if my son will, will kind of follow through too or he's just going to go with call me AJ. And that would just like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's just, I'm going to be very sad that day but if that's what he wants to be called well because he feels more comfortable that way and he might fit in better being called the aj then okay aj but it might know. be aj at 18 but at 23 he's back to his given Hopefully. name it, it might it might it might change over time many mm -hmm. different times and mm -hmm. so 
Yeah. And, and to be honest with you, when you pronounce the name, it's a beautiful name. If, if I were to pronounce, if, I, if you were to write that name down and I could see it, I would butcher it. But when I listen to you pronounce the name, it's a beautiful sounding name. So I don't, there's something about the language and hearing it from a, a speaker, and maybe it's, maybe it's hearing it from a mom, right? Mm -hmm. The mom of, of who, who named her son. It, it, there's something very beautiful about yeah. it. So. Well, I mean, and I don't think it's just like me with um, Latino names or anything like that, but like, for example, Garth, I was looking at your last name and I'm not even going to try and pronounce it because really? I don't. Really? Okay. You know, it's like N. Yeah. Nuffeld? Yeah, Newfeld. See? New, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, and when I say it to people, they, well, whatever, it doesn't well, matter. Well, they, they want to say Neufeld oftentimes, Well, if right? they have any kind of German background, they right. do, but... See, yeah. and, I, and, and that's kind of where I'm a little bit more forgiving because it's like, you know, you might not have the background, just like I don't have the background to pronounce your name correctly. Yeah. Um, yeah, isn't like it that. about just being a little bit humble with how you are approaching people mm -hmm. and their names and even our students? I, I tell my students on the first day, I... I I say, I'm, I'm probably going to butcher some of your names. And what I want you to do is correct, correct me. Correct right. Yes, I yeah. do the same thing. And tell me. Mm -hmm. And then I'm sitting there madly, like, writing really fast at the front of the uh, room, down the list, all the student names that, uh, phonetically, right, so that I can try to remember them next time. I just oh, saw okay, something yes. on Twitter. Uh, someone posted that what she does is that she has her students audio record an mp3 file mm -hmm. of the student pronouncing his or her own first name mm -hmm. and they attach it to an email and so that she has that available and she can play it back at any time mm -hmm. uh, which i think is an awesome idea i've got to, i've got to think about trying to do that i want to switch gears a little bit and and talk about um i guess how we how you and i met mm -hmm. and i, I want to kind of harken back to uh at apa 2018 you were part of a psi beta symposium and i got to hear you talk about the challenges that you have with your students i let me, let me rephrase that the challenges your students have being active involved members of a psi beta chapter so I don't know how much you remember of that presentation, but you talked about the challenges they have attending meetings. And then in that same presentation, you talked about um, your background as a, as a student. Would you mind kind of retelling that? Because I was, I don't know if you remember our conversation after that, but I was just so amazingly impressed about the things that you did uh, to help students be involved and the challenges that your students face in commuting back and forth uh, to, uh, to campus. Mm -hmm. If you wouldn't mind telling uh, us a little sure. bit about that. So um, I am an advisor for Psi Beta at South Texas College, which is where I'm from. Um, and so some of my students are not necessarily uh, US citizens, right? So some of them are undocumented, uh, but of course we don't necessarily ask that, one, because it's not polite, and two, because we don't really need to know. Um, but some of the challenges that they have or barriers that they have is uh, just the the lack of of knowledge of what it really means to be part of that honor society. So they get the recognition that, oh, I have, you know, good grades or whatever, but they don't really see past the merit part. They don't really see the opportunity part. Like Psi Beta is here to provide you with, <clears throat> excuse me, the research experience that we do. Um, or the ability to come and attend a conference if you can cross the checkpoint type of thing, if you can travel within the United States. And um, pretty much like even just attend the meetings to get to better know us as advisors so we can write letters of rec for you or whatever. Um, and a lot of that was limited because there was a lack of um, like a college-going culture in their family. And so that means that a lot of our students are first generation. So mom and dad... Probably had minimal education. Um, I talked about myself, where my dad's level of education is about sixth grade. Uh, my mom did graduate from high school in the United States, but that was about it, because then she had to, you know, go get a job and contribute to the family. Um, and so a lot of those sort of, or that lack of, you know, what is expected of me if I do join an honor society, or like what can I gain from doing that? They don't know because mom and dad didn't have that experience to kind of share with them and be like, you should join student organizations because when I was going to college, it helped or something. Right. But the, but the first gen challenges that you're describing 
are a little bit different than the first gen challenges of let's say a student in Vermont or a student in Idaho mm -hmm. or a student in Kansas. Yeah, I mean there's so <clears throat> much to talk about because right. um okay, well it's not just that we didn't go to college, right? Or like that my parents didn't go to college. But it was because they couldn't, right, financially or something like that. They didn't go to college because college was not in their parents' line of thinking nor in their line of thinking. Like, college was for the elite. College was for white individuals. And I'm sorry I'm pointing to both of you guys. No, but, like, you know. It is what it is. Um, and so the expectation was that if you even dreamed about going to college or mentioned, mentioned it to your family, you were pretty much betraying the family. And that kind of goes with the whole idea of familismo, where family comes first. And so if you leave us, right, or if you don't work to contribute, then you're, you're not thinking of your family first. And that is something that you can pretty much be disowned for. Um, and surely your parents are not going to understand that maybe there is not sort of immediate uh, rewards going to college, but, you know, in four or five years, mom, when I graduate, I'll be able to help you like 10 times more than I do now without a college degree. Like they, they don't see the long term sort of wait period that's required so that you can have a bigger game. Fortunately, my parents were very different. They, they were pushing me like, you need to go to college. And I think that's because they understood more than their parents the value of college or, you know, a higher educational experience. I don't, so, oh, so good. I'm no, sorry. and I was going to say, my parents, I don't think they expected me to go to graduate school. I, I think they were just like, as long as she goes to college, like, we're good with that. So that's another thing. There really isn't a push for, you know, do more. And why didn't you do more? And things like that. So, so the students that you're seeing in your classrooms are probably getting pushback at home. Oh, yes, because definitely. Because be they are betraying their family. And, and also that it's, it's costing us as a family for you to go to college because now we have less income because now you have class and you're not working. Or now I have to drive you to college. So now you're wasting our gas, our mm. gas money. And it's like, so, and that's kind of where I was going with, with Psi Beta that if, we, if we're asking them to come back on a Tuesday at four for a Psi Beta meeting, and let's say, you know, they had already gotten picked up like at noon, Parents are going to be like, I'm not going to take you back. Because some of them may live 20 miles from campus, and that's a long drive. Just to go to a meeting? For what? What are you going to get out of this meeting? And so that's where it's kind of like, I can't go to the meeting. I don't have a ride. My parents don't want to take me. And so. if I'm a Psi Beta advisor, I better make sure those meetings are meaningful. Oh, yes. Because or you change your schedule. <laughs> right? Because you, people you, are being driven back. And the people who are doing the driving are making a sacrifice. Yes, exactly. That's a, a very sacrifice. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. better be a, that better not be a meeting where I just blew off planning for it because I was uh -huh. too busy. Uh, I th it, that meeting has to be, it, it can't be. We're gonna watch a movie and mm -hmm. have popcorn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, there has to be some sort of takeaway, and so I've even had to speak to some parents, right, of my students because they don't believe that their kids are, or that their, you know, their children are doing what they say they're doing. They think they're just kind of like goofing around. And so I literally, you know, I've spoken to a couple of parents and told them like, hi, you know, my name's Liza. I'm the Cybate advisor. This is what we do. This is why it's so important for your child. And I also tell them like your, your son or your daughter is like the top 10% of our psych majors at STC like I hope you realize that is a huge deal because our criteria for for the chapter that I advise is they have to have a 3.5 GPA overall and a 3.5 GPA in their psychology coursework and so we really just get maybe about 30 people out of 500 that are eligible and then out of those 30 I usually get maybe about five to ten people and so when I do get them I'm like come on like you have to understand the value of membership in Psi Beta. And hopefully that'll make it easier that if they go to four-year university that they join Psi Chi. Right, right. And just kind of continue doing that. But I, that's what I tell the parents. I was like, not everybody gets invited to this, okay? Not even like 100 people get invited. You're talking about like less than 30 people out of 500, and your, your child is one of those. So I try and help them see that, you know, 
there is that achievement from their child that they should be proud of and that should maybe help convince them that that sacrifice is worth it. What kind of jobs are their parents doing? So if they weren't doing a college degree, what would they be doing for for jobs? Um, It's mostly like labor, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So we have a lot of parents that um, they either work you know, as like food servers, uh, retail. I mean, you're talking about minimum wage jobs. And with our students that are undocumented, well, at that point you're talking about like labor that's exploitative in nature, uh, cleaning houses, or, you know, mom doesn't work and dad's the only one that's working. And so it might be something like, okay, my dad has work this week, but we don't know about next week. And so we can't really plan for our future that way because it's so unstable. And that's why there's so much difficulty placing the family having N minus one contributor to the yes, income. Yes, yes. Because there really is a sacrifice having that student mm-hmm. not contributing to the family um, income. Yeah, because instead of alleviating the burden, you're putting more of a burden. Yeah, you're, and that getting the gas money and the tuition and the books and the mm-hmm. everything else. And if I remember correctly, you talked about some of your commute. Some of your students are commuting across a border oh yes Mm -hmm. so we live about or stc is maybe about uh less than 20 miles from the mexican border and so we do have a lot of students that are not necessarily um officially international students meaning they don't have like a student visa to cross the border but they are international in the sense that they physically cross the border every day to come to class uh maybe with like a tourist visa or something like that And so for them, that becomes even more of a sacrifice because they're having to wake up, you know, five or six in the morning so that they can, you know, walk across or drive across or whatever to come to class. And, and these are the, and these students, the Psi Beta students are at the top of their class. And so against all of these odds, they are succeeding, they're thriving, they are doing incredibly well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think a lot of them they're curious, like, what is Psi Beta, or what is being part of an honor society, or, and nobody ever stops to tell them, and this is where I talked about my high school experience, Uh, my high school counselors pretty much did their job only with, like, the, either you were the rich student or the white student, and so if you weren't rich and you weren't white, then um, I'm not really going to counsel you the way I'm supposed to, I'm not going to explain to you what are the advantages of, you know, going to this college over this other one or whatever. Um, And so I feel like as the advisor of Psi Beta, that's kind of my role, too, is to really get them to understand this is something you want to take advantage of because, you know, 10 years from now, it's going to help you, you know, or just get them to see that you can be a part of this if you want to. It's not just for a certain type of student. So how did your, so were you, I, I don't know if you went to a two-year, were you a Psi Beta member? Or did you go straight into a four-year? I don't, no, I don't know your I, I did go academic. straight into a four-year. Okay. Um, and then I kind of bombed my freshman year. <laughs> I think most of us do. Oh, uh, Many of us did. Uh, that's right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. And um, so I got the college experience my freshman year, and then I realized I did not do well. And again, my parents' sacrifice is, is not being, you know, um, fully valued in, in what I was, you know, uh, my grades. It, it wasn't reflected mm-hmm. in my performance. And so then I moved to Houston with my sister, and I went to a two-year college there. It was called oh, Willowbrook College, okay. and now it would have been part of the Lone Star College system. And so when I went there, like, I really got my act together. I was like, no, nothing less than an A, and so on and so forth. Um, and I, I don't know if I talked about this at APA, but I had a really interesting experience there in Houston because I found myself not being Latino enough for some of the students, but not being American enough for the non-Latino students. Hmm. And so it was really difficult for me to kind of make friends in my classes because... You know, the Latino students were, like, recently immigrated from Salvador, Honduras, you know, so they were speaking Spanish most of the time. English is my first language, and that's what I prefer. Um, And so when I would talk to them, and I would talk to them in English, they kind of just, you know, resented me a little bit and were like, you know, you're betraying your your kind or whatever. 
or you think you're white, right? It's always that you think you're white. And so then I was like, okay, well, let me try and go over here with like the, you know, I don't know, the American, right? Whatever that looks like. And no, I, I was kind of like, I felt more brown than I really was when I was around them. And so I think that kind of helped me focus on my studies because right. I didn't really get to make too uh, many friends. It's a, it's a woman without a country. <laughs> yeah, it really is. I don't fit of. here. I don't fit over right, here. Right. And so I'm just going to, you know, I don't want to change. I'm not going to just start speaking Spanish because of that or whatever. So, um, so yeah, I really did well. And then I moved back home with my family and I did even better. Um, and then I did my graduate studies there locally too at the University of Texas Pan American back then, but now it's the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Okay. How many so, yeah. siblings? I have I... two older sisters. Okay. And so were you the first to go to college? No, I was not. Okay. Um, my older sister attended college, but she didn't graduate. Okay. My middle sister, she did graduate from college and she would have been the first. So she was the first to graduate from college. Mm -hmm. And she would have been the first to get her graduate degree, but um, she was diagnosed with breast cancer at like 26. So she had to kind of like stop, right? Get treated. And so then I kind of beat her to the punch and I always kind of joke around with her like, I'm the first one to have gotten my master's degree. And she's like, I had cancer. (laughs) That is sisterly love. (laughs) If you can joke with a sister who had cancer and still hold it over her, that I beat you. I mean, you had cancer. I still beat you. I still, I mean, that is, I I love that sisterly love, that family love. Yeah, I mean, we joke about it because otherwise it would be, you know. Well, Did she go back and get her? She did. She went back and she got her master's degree and stuff like that. So, yeah. In what? Uh, She has hers in early education or early administration. She's like a, she's trying to get a principal job. Okay. Right now. That is awesome. Mm -hmm, To be a principal. That is awesome. So you all went to school right around where your fam, where you grew up. Oh, yes. Yes. None of us, at least in my opinion, none of us dared to venture off even further. One, because of the cost. Uh, like we can't afford to go pay out of state tuition because again, my counselors didn't tell me about scholarships or, you know, doing all these other things to try and get funded. Um, and so we all stayed locally. And then I think part of the reason why I came back home was because I knew that I wouldn't have as much, um, I guess financial pressure because my parents were there. And so, um, and I, and I wanted to be close to home. You know, I, I talk to my mom every day. I go to her house every day. Um, so I, I, have, I still have a lot of that collectivist culture going on where, like, my, my identity is derived from belonging to this family, to the group. And so, again, if I leave, if I go for, to north, then I might, you know, that, that connection weakens a little bit. Liza, do you have any sense at all from your parents what, what changed it for them for them to see the value of college for their daughters? Because you talked about how a lot of folks around you didn't. They saw yeah. it as betrayal. Yeah. Do you have any sense of how, how well, are they different? How did they come to be different? I don't know exactly like what it was, but I just remember my mom and dad always telling us, like, we want you guys to have more than we have. And even mm-hmm. now, my dad tells me sometimes, like, oh, you're rich. And I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm like, I would still be classified, I think, as poverty. Um, but in his, in his eyes, I am mm. like, you know, I, I might earn maybe three or four times as much as he does. And so because of that, I have succeeded so much in his eyes, even mm. though, like, in my opinion, relative to other people, um, no. Like, I'm, I'm barely, you know, I'm okay. And so... Um, in, I think in my parents' eyes, I have kind of done what they wanted, which was to have more than they do, especially at their age. I'm pretty sure when they were, you know, in their 30s, right, they didn't have necessarily what I have now. Right. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, yeah, my dad always does that. Like, well, just because I pay for your dinner doesn't mean I'm rich, you know. Well, but it's <laughs> okay. So, so I'm a dad, and mm-hmm. I have a daughter who's 27. I can tell you that dads do this, that you want better for your children. Mm-hmm. And, and is, so is, is this your first child? Is this is my second. 
So, so, so this would be my second. So, so pregnant with my second. So, so you you get you've already started thinking about this. Oh yes, I'm already like you this. are gonna get your PhD no matter what. Right, and <laughs> and Garth is a father of a six year old. You're we're all parents. You start mm-hmm. thinking about what you want that, and so I. You get it on some level of what what your dad means mm-hmm. about wanting something better, and even though he might not, he might over be overthinking the scale of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you have to know how amazingly proud he is of of what you've accomplished in the short amount of time, mm-hmm. comparatively speaking. No, yeah, and I tell him like um, I'm going like when I went to APA in Washington, he's like, "Where are you going?" And I was like, "To Washington," and I had never been to Washington, and I don't think my dad ever dreams of being, going to Washington. And so he just, like, looked at me like, what do you do again? Like, why are you going? Like, like it was this grand thing for him. And I was like, well, I'm just going to go to a conference for a couple of days. But from that point on, it was like, oh, Liza's going to go to Washington, like, telling my tios and my tias, like, va a ir para, you know, over here and over there. And um, I'm just like, well, it's not that big of a deal. But to him, it was a very big deal. But don't, but, okay, so I'm, I'm going to call time out on here. But it it is kind of a big deal, don't you think, to go to Washington D.C. and be part of a symposium, the American Psychological Association? Think about think about our four year colleagues and our two year colleagues, and how many people submitted and how many rejections there were on the program. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, you don't have to agree with me, but it kind of is a big well, I deal. I think that's where the culture comes in too. That I'm not going to self promote in that way. Um, it's all about maintaining the modesty because otherwise, and this is what I said at APA, like people are going to be like, oh, ya te crees. Like you think you're better than us. And so a lot of the times I don't really tell my family, my extended family, what I do because it's just kind of like looked down on. Um, yeah. now, I'm, I'm going to be respectful of that because that's a real cultural value. But I, I'm go, I, can, can we explore this for a couple minutes? Mm-hmm. Because I, I talk to my students a lot, and I will say mostly female students, about imposter phenomenon. Oh, yes. And uh, we, we mentioned that yesterday yeah. in the work-life balance. And, and, and it's, a, mm-hmm. it's been a theme on this podcast with many guests. And, and so I, I, I want to I I be very respectful of the cultural traditions. However, if you don't ever talk about your accomplishments your students don't ever hear about what you can do, mm-hmm. then they may not think that they can ever do those same things. The role model that you can be, the amazing role model that I know that you are, because I've heard you speak enough about it, and there's not a lot of students in that APA symposium sitting in that room. There's faculty members in that room. There's not mm-hmm. a lot of students in that room. Students need to hear that, those stories that you're telling so that they can see the role model, so they can become like you. Mm-hmm. And but if you are humble and modest about it, then they might not think that they can ever do that. Yeah, I had not thought of that. Um, yeah. For me, it's always like don't draw too much attention to yourself, I and I think that's that. the collectivist culture too. But um, at APA, I did have a student, a Latina student, come up to me afterwards uh, during the award ceremony for Psi Beta. Mm-hmm. And she was crying, and she was like, you know, thank you so much for, for your talk. And, and so when I saw her, and, when she was, and she was hugging me, and she's like, can I take a picture with you? And I'm yes. just like, me? Like, yes. why? <laughs> why? Because you're a role model. You're yeah. a successful role and model. At that point, I did feel very, very validated. Like, I went home, and I was just like, okay, so all the stress that I get <laughs> at work, or every, it, it meant something. But- um, but it's more than validated. So I'm glad you felt validated. That is awesome. But it's more than validated. It is that other people can see what you have accomplished and they can see what they might be able to accomplish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's more than that. I, I believe in my heart of hearts, our students need to see themselves in the classroom. And too many white males in the front of the classroom means that our non-white, non-male students don't see role models of themselves. Mm-hmm. And, so, and so your DNA is not, I know you a little bit enough to know that your DNA is never built to brag. And I, don't think, I think most faculty members don't like to brag. They just don't like it. Mm-hmm. I, I know a couple of exceptions. Other, <laughs> and I'm not going to talk about them while these are on, right. all right? But other than those folks, 
They don't like to brag. They don't like to self-promote. One of the lovely things about this podcast is that we get to have people on and talk to them, and we get to promote them. And when we have book authors on, we always make them talk about their books because they would mm-hmm. never talk about their own books. Mm-hmm. So that's always been a great deal of fun. And so, and so, and you'll not, and Liza, you'll never brag about yourself, but but to talk about what you've accomplished in a humble way tells other Latino girls and Latino young women and Latino young men. Mm-hmm hearing your story of what you had to do and you understanding that cultural break that you made from that collectivist culture to do something individualistic for yourself to advance yourself is an amazingly powerful story, which is why I asked you to write a success story for the book that Steve Davis and I are revising. And so Mm -hmm. something to think about. I, I fall into lecture mode a lot. Mm-hmm. on this podcast, as Garth understands, but it's just a really important story that you get to tell because you've lived it. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, well, I have yeah, I have a reflection, and, and that is, I wonder if those who you're really close to, like family, if, if and I, maybe we all have these personas, because our families know us, right? So maybe with our families, we're one way, but maybe with our students, we need to be something else for them. Um, and whether that is to brag on ourselves a little bit and let them know that they can do it. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe there are these different personas that we can yeah. like learn or live into or whatever. But I'm interested about this um, success story. I haven't heard about this before. So what did Eric ask you to do? Because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he pretty much asked me to write about um, how I came to, to be a little bit successful, right? See, I can't even say <laughs> successful. Um, and kind of, you know, tell a little bit about the journey that it, not just me, but my family that we all took in order for me to get to where I am. And so, again, I, I think that's an example of how I can never pretty much break myself away from what my parents have done. I'm going to get really emotional It's right okay. Now. It's all right. Um, what my parents have done to, to help me get to where I'm at. So um, I wrote about a story uh, that my mom told me one time. And we were just driving and randomly one day. And she's like, oh, do you remember when you were a cheerleader in middle school? And I was like, yes, don't remind me. And um, she's like, yeah, you came home and you were asking for all this money to get the uniform and the shoes. And, and, um, and she's like, and your dad and I didn't have any money. And I was like, and I kind of like stopped and I was like, okay. I was like, so what happened? Like, where did you get the money? Because I ended up being a cheerleader, right? And she's like, well, you came in and you were like, well, it's due in a week. And so your dad and I, you know, we went to the local um, like financing shark. Really, that's what they are. And um, we borrowed the money from him. And I was like, mom, how much interest did he charge you? She's like, well, I think like 25 percent. And I'm like, what? And, and that that speaks to their lack of financial literacy. Right. And so um, when she told me that, I was like, why didn't you just tell me no? Like, why don't you just, you know, be honest and be like, uh, no, we're not going to spend $200 on something that is not maybe going to go anywhere, right? But for her, it was like, well, you know, you seem like you really wanted to do it, and I didn't want to deny that, and so we figured out how to get it for you. And I and I just, I started crying, and I was just like, where do you want to go on vacation? <laughs> like, I'll, I'll take you wherever you want. Payback. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and I think that, you know, I... As a parent, we do. We make sacrifices and things like that. But I I realized at that moment that it wasn't just a sacrifice. It was like a, to me, like a grand sacrifice um, because of the time constraint, you know, because of the fact that I was like so demanding. And and at that point, I felt when she was like telling me and describing how I asked her, I felt very like self-centered and thoughtless. Like I wasn't thinking of my family and how that would affect maybe their ability to buy groceries or pay for gas. I was just thinking about myself and typical adolescent, right? Exactly. Thank you for adding that last part. How <laughs> yeah. old were you? <laughs> yeah, I was in middle school. Okay. So I was probably maybe like 13 or something. And hey, thank uh, <laughs> you. A 13 year old was thinking about herself. <laughs> yeah. All right. How but, normal. The, the yeah. earth continues to spin on its <laughs> axis. All right. No, but thank again, you. but in hindsight now, I'm like, man, I was such a, you know, selfish little brat. Like, I shouldn't have, you know, uh, thought that I deserved 
to ask for such a, a sacrifice from my parents. Like, it wasn't something for my academics. It wasn't something, even today, like, I'm like, I, I, it wasn't worth it. Like, Wait. why? Okay, all right. And now I'm going to call time out again. <laughs> and I, I know, I feel like I'm father time with the white beard and, you know, I'm, I'm the oldest one in the room, as Garth likes to point out every <laughs> chance that he gets. But, were, but are, are you misremembering? Were you really little miss rant and rave i mean did you stomp around and have a tantrum or did you ask once knowing knowing you now i'll bet you asked very politely and you were excited about it you probably didn't know what it cost i I probably didn't demand it i don't remember myself exactly how i felt but i know i probably didn't demand it because i'm not like that exactly but i'm pretty sure that i maybe asked for for it more than once like, I might have mentioned okay. it, and then, you know, like, Mom, you know, are, are we going to do this? Like, when are you going to give me the money? You know, and in my mind, it was always like, you have to do this, you know? Yeah, but that's in your mind, but you weren't putting that pressure on your mom. You were just thinking it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, I just want to... Yeah. I, I don't get to control what you think or what you feel <laughs> or how much you beat up on yourself, but if I could have control over that, I would encourage you to cut yourself some slack. Yeah. Your mother loves you and adores you. It, looks, it sounds like she would do anything for you. And she did that time, and she would still today, I would imagine. Just like you're going to do for your kids. Yes. Hopefully, yes, I can. So I will be able to. So can I, can I go to, uh, in graduate school, you mind if I shift directions a sure. little yeah, bit? Uh, in graduate school, what did you study exactly? So... I was looking into developmental psych. I'm very interested in maternal behavior, right, and uh, maternal attachment and things like that. And so I took an animal behavior class with my mentor, um, which she wasn't my mentor then, but she later became my mentor. And she had a project that was um, going to the local zoo and studying a brand new mother gorilla and her infant. And so I just jumped on it. I was like, I want to do this. And so I ended up kind of like shifting from a more clinical, because I wanted to do like child psychology, like clinical psych, but for kids. Um, And I shifted more towards the experimental. And so um, I spent most of my graduate career, like all of my graduate career, really just collecting data for her at the zoo, doing focal animal sampling with the gorillas. So we got some very interesting uh, data on... um, my master's thesis was on the relationship between maternal care, the quality of maternal care, and then the development of infant sociability. So that's what I did in graduate school, and I'm still very much like an experimental psychologist today because I don't like clinical psych. I'm kind of like, uh. That's okay. <laughs> but are you, are you teaching mostly now? Are you doing research as well? No, I teach. I teach at STC at the college. Mm-hmm. Um, the research that I do is really for Cybeta's national project. So... I feel like I kind of keep myself going with that um, and with my students because I tell them nowadays you need research experience freshman and sophomore year. And if you're at STC freshman and sophomore year, you need to be exposed to it. Otherwise, when you get to the four-year university, you're going to be behind. Everybody else is going to have research experience and you're not. You're not going to get into labs as easily. Um, And so I do some research with the Beta National Project. We collected, I think, over 500 um, participants this last year, which is really good. I'm excited because now we have like a national sample of over 2,000. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Talk about, if you don't mind, talk a little bit about what 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 Psi Beta has been able to allow you to provide to your students. Well, um, the, one of the things that drew me towards Psi Beta as a faculty member was the National Research Project. Mm-hmm. Because in our institution, we don't offer research methods. And I feel like that's one of the most important courses for a psych student to take. We still can offer it because of our state legislation, whatever. Mm. And so um, that's what drew me to it. I was like, this is a great opportunity because they pretty much like outline everything for you. Every Like the references are there. They have a primary hypothesis there. They give you um, the measures, right? So all you have to do is get your students to collect data, right? Administer the surveys or proctor the surveys. 
Um, and then after that, you can choose to um, analyze the data and then submit to regional and national conferences, or you could just stop there, right? Just collect the data. And so that's kind of what I started doing with, uh, as a Sci-Beta advisor, is I started focusing more on that Sci-Beta research project for our students as a way to offer them research methods and also the research experience and then the, you know, the experience coming to conferences coming from a community college or like coming from the associate level. And are, so, am I getting this right? You're currently the vice president of the region? Yes. Okay, how long have you been serving in that capacity? So I think this is my second term. Okay. I'm starting my second term this fall. It's a two year term? It's a two-year term. Uh -huh. and you get to cycle twice. And after that, you'll run for president? <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. I'm interested in the CAPE committee. You would be awesome. Yeah. You yeah. would be great. Yeah. You really should do that. I, I would highly recommend it. Okay. Yeah. But, also, yeah, but also president of Cybeta, too, as well. I hear that you guys are about to announce your new uh, executive director. Yes, yes, um, that's true. I, I know you can't, I know you're not supposed to tell us, and this won't, this won't release for four or five months, mm -hmm. but I, I spoke with Catherine Wicks yesterday, yes, and, uh -huh. and, and she teased it, but she didn't release it either, so, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. But you're no. excited, it sounds like. Yes, yeah, cool. I think Cy, since I've been there, I feel like Cybeta has just like grown right. and it's going to continue to grow. And what it does for our students is, is great. Like one of the things that I kept telling um, Jerry, right, Jerry Redman, our executive director now, was that um, like we don't have SPSS in our community college because they just don't want to buy it for us, sure. right? And so um, he pretty much found uh, JASP, right, which is that mm -hmm. free and open resource for stats. And so little things like that, that we can share with other chapter advisors across the country that don't have access to SPSS either, I mean, I feel like that is helping students, again, get something rather than nothing at the associate level right. so that they can be comparable or somewhat comparable to individuals that start at the four-year university and stay there. So yeah, I really, really advocate for Psi Beta's growth and even, you know, how much programming time we have at regional conferences and Psychi has always been so awesome in allowing us to to collaborate with them and do the exchange and yesterday we did the awards that's great with Psychi. um so yeah I think how long have you been at your current institution um nine years okay so i started really early um i graduated i remember in december and then two weeks later i was like teaching in January. So I was, I was very full lucky. time, full time. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I've been there ever since. And I will probably stay there because I really like what well, I do. Well, and plus it's so close to your parents, mm -hmm. so it, to your entire family. I'm yes. Imagining. Well, do you yes. feel like you kind of won the lottery to be able to find a place to work so close to your family, a place that you like? Oh yes. Yeah. Yes. I always tell everybody like, I am so lucky because like my, the, my department chair, whom was department chair when I got hired and then he kind of stepped down and now he's back. I always tell him like, thank you so much for the opportunity because had you not like taken a chance and stuff like that, who knows what I have been, what I might be doing now. And I feel like I really found what I want to do because I love to talk about psychology, right? Mm -hmm. I love to teach. I love the research part. And so I get that with Cybeta. I don't have necessarily the pressure of the publisher parish, even though I still try and publish. <laughs> um, but I don't have to, right? Which I think alleviates a lot of the pressure. And it is close to home, yeah. right? You know, my son comes to my office sometimes because we're just doing like a shift change between me and my husband. And so um, I like that it's inviting enough or, you know, I don't know what the word is, but that he can come to my office mm -hmm. maybe for like an hour and while I get done and then go home and things like that. So, yeah. Did, did you start the Psi Beta chapter at your college? Um, I was one of the co-founders, okay. yes. And recently, we I'm trying to kind of get the other campuses to do a chapter on their own. Um, but we got one other chapter at another campus that we're starting up that we just did it last year. So hopefully we can get them going a little bit more. Because one of the problems with our students was that they lived in, like, Rio Grande City, which is about an hour drive from McAllen. And so for a meeting, again, they're not going to commute. 
And what I started doing with them was just kind of like, okay, let's conference, conference call, or let's FaceTime, right. or let's do something. Um, because what ends up happening, and I think we all can attest to this, is that if our students don't go or they're not part of the meeting, then they kind of slowly start to, you know, that attrition, right? Mm -hmm. they, they go away, and that's not what I want. I don't want them to be discouraged just because they can't attend the meetings. So I try and make it a point to figure something out for everyone. Can I make a prediction? May I make a prediction? I have a prediction for you and your future. I predict... I win the lottery? Um, <laughs> I, I hope that for your future, but I, statistically speaking, I'm not going to predict that. Okay. I predict in your future department chair. I predict in your future... Dean, assistant dean, associate dean, whatever it is at your school, mm -hmm. dean. There's amazing leadership potential. There is a natural, I don't know what the word for it is. I wish I had, the, but there's, there's some, there's, Liza, there's something about you that's genuine, that is inspiring, that when you let the real you out, you know, when you're not afraid to talk about you, mm -hmm. that is just, inspiring and amazing and so I, I think if that's what something you ever aspire to you know a chair a dean a national president of Cybeta, whatever you want to do sometime in your future I think that will be uh, the world will be at, at your feet thank you yeah I think one of the the things that kind of limits me from actually taking those jumps right or those leaps into the more um, administrative positions is the fact that Again, the stratification by gender, by age, and by ethnicity. Um, you know, I was asked to be department chair a couple of years back. Oh, look at that! Right. Huh. I well, let the record <laughs> reflect that I did not know. I did not know that. Um, but <clears throat> I, I was like, no, one because I didn't feel ready. Like okay, I didn't feel like you. I had the the you. leadership sort of skills yet. Um, I tend to be a little impatient uh, with people sometimes. And I felt like I wasn't going to get the respect because I'm a woman, because a lot of the faculty, like I, I think I'm one of the youngest faculty members. Um, and because I think, I don't know how many faculty are Latino and how many are non-Latino, um, but it's not all Latinos. And so I felt like that was also going to, you know, have a sort of like an implicit effect. Sure. And the same thing with, you know, a dean position or something like that. I really hesitated to do the regional position for Psi Beta. Um, but it was just like, I want to do it. I want to do it. But I was like, oh, but they're not going to pick me because, you know, of all these things. I don't want to get rejected. And, and so I finally, I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to do it. If they say no, like, okay, they say no, right. right? And so when I got selected, I was like in disbelief. I was like, but why, why are you picking me? <laughs> you know, I'm pretty sure there was somebody else that was probably more qualified or maybe better. And so I think that kind of goes back to the fact yes, that. Yes, I understand. Yeah. And um, so with the department chair, I'm hoping that with some of the other things that I'm doing, that my faculty will see that I'm competent and hopefully kind of, you know, maybe respect me more enough to see me as a department chair. We've had other female department chairs that are non-Latinos, and they, they got some heat from some of the, the older white males, and that's because she was white. Um, but it was because she was a girl, because she was female, right? She was a woman. And so, yeah. Well, That's you'll 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 trust yourself, obviously, and you know that the local culture of your campus better than I would know. And mm -hmm. I'm I'm a member of your fan club, and so I I just I just see amazing potential. And I've been in this business for 30 years, mm -hmm. and I think I can recognize it the talent when I can see it. And so I, I hope you won't limit yourself when you're ready to do what you want to do. Yeah, and you know, I've thought about maybe moving to another college where I might have more of an opportunity. But then again, I think like, I don't wanna leave my right. family. That's something that, that's just like, no, especially because my parents are, are aging. Right. I know they're gonna need more help. Right. And my sisters have already told me like, oh, so, you know, you're the one that's gonna take care of mom and dad, just FYI. <laughs> and I'm like, 
okay. And, that sounds um, like siblings. Yep, that sounds like siblings. Yeah, and I'm just like, you know what? I don't have a problem with that. Um, and so I kind of feel, you know, a little tied down in that way because of the culture, right? right. Um, where I wouldn't be able to, like, for example, you say you're from Seattle, like, I would love to live there, you know, to experience that. But again, I can't because my obligation is to my aging parents. Um, and also I feel like I don't want my son to have um, those like remote grandparents, right? Where yeah. it's like only on Christmas or only on Thanksgiving. And my parents are very traditional in the sense that they don't travel. Right. They don't. They Unless expect- you're going to go see family, you're not going to go travel. That's why my dad would probably never go to Washington. It's like, Dad, they have awesome museums. It's like, why? <laughs> <laughs> Who lives there? Is anybody that we know lives there? <laughs> yeah, because when I traveled, you know, as a child, we only went to places where we had relatives because we weren't going to stay in a hotel. Yeah. So it's like, okay, we're going to go to Monterrey because, you know, you have an aunt there and we're going to sleep on the floor, you know, or we're going to go to Guadalajara. It was, it was just always Mexico. Sure. So. So, yeah. Wow. Well, you have an unbelievable story. And I'm so glad that you're kind of in the national scene now because I think uh, you have lots to contribute from what I am hearing. And I hope you do uh, run for CABE sometime soon. I think that they would be be lucky to have you. Absolutely. And and that is a really good place. Uh, The people who go through CABE, I mean, CABE does... Some big, big things. They do. So yeah, I've been I've been to some of their talks at APA, and mm-hmm. I mean that's where I was like, oh man, I really want to get into that because yeah. I know that like our students are a special population where they have these unique challenges. Like like last year, my um, one of my students was a um, she wasn't even DACA; she was just undocumented, and she won Swapa's final you know research competition where you have to come and give a talk of whatever you did, right, of your paper. And so we had all planned, like, okay, we're going to go to Swapa, everybody ready, blah, blah, blah. And then somebody told me, like, oh, you might want to mention, you know, that we are going to cross a checkpoint. And I was like, oh, I was, like, totally taken aback, like, duh. Like, I should have known this. And so um, I wrote a list, and I I didn't want to be so obvious about it because I don't want to make anybody feel bad. But I made a list of like, okay, make sure you have this, make sure you have that, make sure you have that. And then on one of the bullets, I put, you know, please be aware we'll be crossing a checkpoint and that you have appropriate paperwork. Or I don't remember what I said um, because I don't want to get anybody else in trouble either, right, if you're traveling with others. And so then the day before we were leaving, my student comes in and she's like, she closes the door, right, and she's kind of emotional. And she's like... Um, She's like, okay, I have something to tell you. And I never would have thought she was undocumented. Like, I, I don't mean to stereotype or anything right, like that, but, right. but it just never occurred to me, like, oh, what is your status? When I look at my students, I don't think, what is your status? Mm-hmm. And so she came to me, and she's like, well, I just spoke with my attorney. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she's like, I, um, about crossing the border, I don't know what she said. Um, she's like, my attorney told me that if I take this paper, which I think she was applying for DACA or something like that, or she was in the middle of it, but she wasn't like officially like accepted or whatever it is that you do. And she's like, he said that this might be enough for me to cross the checkpoint. And so as soon as she said that, I just looked at her and I was like, I'm sorry, but no, I'm not going to let you do that. I'm not going to let you flip the coin on your life. Like right. that is right. no, no matter how awesome it is that you got this recognition and this award. And I was so sad for her. Like I remember when she left, I just started crying because I was like, this is, this is not cool. Like this is so unfair because she did the work. She's deserving of it. And yet she's limited. Like she's not able to do it because of this. And so she, and she also told me, she's like, well, my parents, um, told me that whatever you think. And at that point, I'm just like, well, who am I to decide? But in their parents, in her parents' eyes, I was more educated. Right. So therefore my kind of like opinion or my say was probably going to be the right one. And I, and I looked at her, I was like, no, like, no. I was like, one, you don't know these agents 
They could have had a bad day with their spouse in the morning and they're in a crappy mood and they just, you know, it's so arbitrary. Like they can just like, no, they can be a not nice person about it or they can be cool about it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, and no, like it's not worth it. Even though it is a big deal. Like at that point, it's not worth it. Cause this is your life. Like, are you, are you telling me that you're willing to put yourself in a position where you may or may not get deported and you've lived here your whole life? And uh, she was just like crying and crying because she really wanted to go. And then she also felt guilty because she was going to let the rest of her team or like our research team down. And I was like, you know what? Like, no, like, don't even think about them. Don't even worry about them. But that that's the culture also. That yeah. now I'm letting down the group. And so I, I was trying to get them, you know, I contacted Swapa and I was like, is there any way we can Skype the talk or something, you know, because I still wanted her to, to get that experience somehow. But it was just too short notice. Like it was like literally the next day is when she was going to present at Swapa. So when a few minutes ago when I was talking about Cave, you went into this story. And is it because you feel like if you had a seat at that table, you'd be able to represent those yes. students? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, really. Mm. I'm sorry I went off on a tangent. No, no, no. no. no don't be I sorry. got it. I got it immediately no. where you were okay. going with and, it. And, and there's the yeah. passion of why you need to be at, be at that table. And I hope you will remember that because it may take a little bit more self-promotion that you're comfortable with. And being able to say, I have accomplished these things, and I am worthy of being at that table. And you will be slightly uncomfortable self-promoting, but for a greater cause, Mm -hmm. for a greater good, Mm -hmm. to be able to protect and promote your students. Yeah, because, I mean, there's a lot of students out there that can do it. They just have these barriers, whether it's, like, mom and dad or other family members. Like, one of my students told me the other day... um, that because she was helping me with the research right and I asked her for something and she's like well you know I didn't have time to do it because my family wanted me to go to like this baptism party or something like that and I'm thinking in my head like really a baptism party like no this is more important but for her it was like if she didn't go to that she was going to get so much heat for it that that it outranked the priority then that's because she's like a top student right but again that's to, in, even if she were to explain to her family, and I, I feel this is like where the Latino and non-Latino stuff comes in, because I think like a white family would be like, oh, you're doing research? Oh, yeah, definitely stay home and do that, because that is more important. Right. And, the, and the Mexican family is like, oh, again, ya te crees, like you think, you're, you think you're better than us, and now we're not good enough for you. You know, and it's just like, no, it's not that. It's just that this is important. But for them, being in that barbecue or whatever, even though you're just sitting there, right? I remember going to some of my family gatherings, and I'm like, I could be at home reading my articles. And instead, I'm like, I'm just sitting here just to, um, like, save face for my parents and to meet my cultural obligation that I'm here, even though that's, like, my third cousin, you know? And so it, it's it's this constant battle between... And that goes back to our ethnic identity thing. It's like, you know, if I reject the family and say, it's because I have schoolwork, I'm being too white. Like, ya te crees gringa. And it's like, "Um, no, I just want to be a good student. That doesn't mean I'm less Mexican because of it. And so there's a price to pay when you do that. That's all so fascinating. Yeah, it is. I, this is why I so this is why I have semi stalked you for months. <laughs> saying, can we meet at Swapa? Can we please be, where? What conferences are you going to be at? Yeah. Because I loved hearing your story, and it's just it's a world I don't live in. See, if I was if I were to share this podcast with my family, one, they probably wouldn't listen to it Aww. because they think I'm showing off, and two, they'd be I don't know their reaction would be like okay, now you think you're white. You're doing a podcast? Like, that's very white. Sorry, no offense. Well, okay, well, the two hosts are <laughs> white males. But, but the, the flip side for me is that I learned so much, and I have Hispanic males and females in my classes, and I want to be more attuned to what may be going on in their lives mm-hmm. so that I can be more respectful and understanding. Well, I think there are subtle differences, though, between, like, first-generation students versus um, my grandparents have been living in the United States since they were young. Right. So, like, for example, my parents were born and raised in Mexico, and so I am first-generation where, 
you know, I was born in the United States and I was raised here uh, versus like, I don't know, I go to San Antonio or Houston and some of those Mexicans that were there, right, and I have air quotes because, you know, there's different, it's almost like there's different, um, I don't know, levels or not levels, but sure. you know what I mean? I do. Like there's a spectrum, right? Mm-hmm. And so because their parents were born and raised here, it's like, well, we're not the same type of Mexican. Interesting. Mm-hmm. But that, but that, but that nuance is a world I don't understand, but I need to be able to appreciate it, and that's why I love talking to you when we met in in, in Washington D.C. And I loved our interactions over email, and I thank you so much for making time for us this afternoon. This has been amazing. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so, so much. nice to meet you. Yes. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, yeah no problem. Mm-hmm.